Chobham in Surrey, heart of the home counties. Down the road to Great Windsor Park, over the hill to Royal... We have these sort of experiences around Barber, and they've had people who've been speaking in other languages. And anyway, it was, it was old hat to them. All Bubba's devotees are eager to tell their own story of his impact on them. Kathy McCormick was an academic. Now she lectures on Baba's yoga. Something hit me. It was as though a sonic boom had occurred just above my head. And I don't know exactly how to describe it, except that a level of my being was open that I never knew existed. It was absolutely incredible. Tremendous love, tremendous ecstasy. And this went on for about two weeks. I mean, I was a complete basket case. It was all I could do to put one foot in front of the other. You know, I mean, I'm, I tried to be a very controlled person. I very much just like freaking out in front of other people. So I, it was about two weeks before I could chant without weeping. You know, I mean, it was, it was a terribly, terribly profound experience, and I found that it never leaves. The claims sound extreme. To us, the very idea of a guru is exotic. But to much of the world's population, the belief in living spiritual teachers is a commonplace, and their influence a matter of record. Even politicians have had such a reputation, as did Mahatma Gandhi, or Mayor Baba, the silent master, or the yogi Ramana Marashi, or Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the teacher of transcendental meditation, who recently met Baba in Switzerland and acknowledged that he'd reached the highest possible level of spiritual attainment. Baba himself left home at 15 to search for the direct experience of God. He became a monk and received his religious name, Muktananda, which means bliss of freedom. He met and lived with many of India's holy men and gurus and claims to have mastered many forms of yoga. But in spite of all this, he said that his search only bore fruit when, after 25 years of wandering, he met his own guru, Bhagavan Nityananda, who transmitted the force that awakened him. The force is called Shakti. Muktananda's feeling for his guru seems to be the equivalent of the feeling that a devout Christian has for Christ. The guru is seen as the perfect one, the one who shows in his person the essential divine nature of the whole of the universe. The North Indian town of Ganeshpuri, near Bombay, grew up around Bhagavan Nityananda's ashram. And when Nityananda died, the focus of attention turned to Baba's ashram on a nearby hillside. It grew from a small group of huts to its present scale. A prominent feature in Baba's ashram is the statue and shrine of Nityananda, where reverence is still offered daily. But here there's no doubt that it's Muktananda himself who is lord of all he surveys. The place and its life is seen as an extension of the Guru's inner state. The ashram is a complete environment. It provides work and lodging and is constantly being extended and beautified. Everything is done absolutely in accordance with the precepts of the master, who is provider and administrator as well as teacher. Through surrender to this discipline, the devotees believe that their own inner state comes closer to that of their guru. So the guru's role is twofold. First, to awaken the disciples' spiritual energy, and then to guide them through what may be a long process of maturing until they share the guru's spiritual awareness. This whole process is called Siddha Yoga. Siddha Yoga is an internal process rather than an external technique. Many people are familiar with the different forms of Kundalini Yoga that are practiced under an external teacher. He may have you concentrate on different chakras of the body, different energy centers. Uh, he may give you different breathing exercises to perform, may have you do different hatha yoga postures and so on. But in Siddha Yoga, this all happens spontaneously as the result of the touch of the guru or as a result of receiving the guru's grace, Shaktipat. Uh, you often hear many people immediately begin automatically to do this pranayama. Some people do automatic hatha yoga postures. When it's called for, it occurs. You see, it's, the guru actually transmits his own consciousness into you, you see, and it, it's, it's fully intelligent and continues to function inside you.
come to the focus of the Swami's visit. Two days of intensive spiritual exercises. Everyone has been urged to keep their attention directed within, to meditate on their own inner being, and not to be distracted by what may happen around them, because now is the time at which the most concentrated effect of the Guru's presence may be felt, the awakening of Kundalini by the Guru's touch. After the ceremony, there's a session when the participants share with each other what they experienced in the meditation. I was so heavily 
into the meditation that I had spontaneous silence. When I came out, I didn't feel like talking to anyone at all, but just resting very peacefully, very quietly in my inner self. And that was a very important experience for me, because I tend to talk a lot to people on the other <laughs> and to relate to people very much straight like this, looking at them and talking to them. And it was a very beautiful thing for me to be able to just sit in my inner self and watch the kind of relationships which developed with other people all around me while I was sitting in this very peaceful in the place. After a few minutes, this image seemed to come in like a kind of aeroplane at me, you know, from very, very way down. It kind of boom like that flat on my head. <laughs> and it was um, an image of a, it seemed from a very, very, very long time ago, you know. And it was an image of a, of a, of a girl, a little girl. Uh, or it could have been a boy, I thought it might have been my half-brother who died, but I don't think it was anybody really. It was just a little girl sitting on a wall, like as if it had been an old photograph taken. And she was leaning towards the camera like that, looking really, very happy, you know, very, very happy. And I looked at it, and I couldn't stand it, because it was so happy, you know? <laughs> and, um, it was as if uh, all the, all the resentment that I felt with other people other people's habits brought through my life um, because of the memory of this very primarily happy person, you know. I'm not Australian very well. Anyway, after that, I went into that room and I completely broke down. <laughs> and um, uh, when I recovered, after that, it was, um, I had a very kind of hallucinogenic <laughs> experience for 12 hours, um, right and through until the next morning where uh, the whole world went extremely, um, extremely pretty, not beautiful, pretty. And everything was very precise and pretty, and, and the colours were all pink and yellow and uh, very three-dimensional. And uh, that lasted really until then. The atmosphere is so highly charged that the outsider can't help wondering if this isn't just the triggering off of pent-up emotions, which sometimes trip over into hysteria, and if enlightenment isn't just a form of neurosis. And if it is something else, how is it different from these psychological disorders? We put this question to an educational psychologist from the University of Michigan, who's been associated with Muktananda and watched this effect many times. What is it that makes it different and makes it other, what makes it not, not a hysteria, not a... You begin to see that people's lives change in a positive way. And, you be, and that, that's a little vague, but what I mean by that, and it's vague because I'm talking about a whole group of people at once, but what I mean by that is that <clears throat> in the hysteria, it just goes on and on and on and on, and the person literally starts, uh, their lives start to disintegrate, start, start to crumble. Whereas with this, it doesn't go on and on and on, there's more crumbling and more crumble. What happens is it happens, it's over with, the person understands something from that, and they rise to a new, a higher level. Um, they, become, they get clearer on life. Uh, they feel more connected to their world, not more alienated. You know, when you're talking about psychology, and different manifestations, disorders, essentially you're talking about being alienated from the world. And what I see all the time are people getting more and more in touch with their world, being able to move in situations that they never were able to move in before, being able to relate to people that they could never relate to before, uh, being able to just be and live life the way that they could never do it before. So all of those things are the things that, from a psychologist's point of view, Makes, you have to say, this is different. I, I spent a lot of time with Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs, but this was slightly different. Um, I've not seen people, a bit like the old Quakers, I think, quaking. Yeah. And I, I was sort of thinking back in terms of history, what their experiences were. But would you have said that there was an enthusiasm which is perhaps lacking in the established church? I think this sort of freshness and liberation is, is growing everywhere.